Welcome back to the uh, Dr. Uh, Craig Keener webinar. Uh, it's great to be back with you again. Uh, we had a wonderful day yesterday uh, in the, the book of Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount and, and also uh, in Matthew chapter two. Uh, so it's great to be back and, and uh, to, uh, to allow Dr. Keener to, to uh, open up uh, the Bible again for us uh, into the, the writings of the Apostle John. Uh, we're gonna be looking at the Gospel of John uh, and also the book of the Revelation. Um, and uh, my name is Richard Flashman. I'm a staff missionary with Chosen People Ministries. And uh, we're delighted uh, that you could be with us again uh, this afternoon. Uh, yesterday, we had over 1,659 unique views uh, coming into uh, Dr. Keener's seminar. And, that's, and then Dr. Keener says, that's because they came to see me. And I said, no, I don't think so, Dr. Keener. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was for you, <laughs> and uh, and so it was. It's uh, it's great to be uh, back again, and and uh, hopefully we'll even go beyond that uh, this afternoon. Uh, with that, uh, we we're sorry we weren't able to get to the book of James uh, yesterday. Uh, it was it was it was a a aspirational goal, uh, but there's so much rich content in Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount. It was just uh, it was uh, it was just beyond what we were able to do. But we're gonna we're excited about uh, John and Revelation. Uh, today and uh, and I, and again, it's my privilege to invite uh, to excuse me to introduce to you, uh, Dr. Craig Keener. Um, he is the uh, FM and and Ada Thompson Professor of Biblical Studies at Asbury Seminary uh, in Wil uh, Wilmore, uh, Kentucky. Uh, he is a, a PhD from Duke University. He married uh, uh, Medine, who is a PhD from the University of Paris in history. Uh, and they have genius children. Just kidding. Uh, and and uh, maybe they are. <laughs> and um, and they, uh, Dr. Keener is the writer of, of over 28 uh, scholarly uh, text texts uh, with over a million copies being purchased of, of, of his scholarship. Um, he uh, he has um, he has won over six major book awards uh, in in his writings. Uh, he has. He um, has served at, at, uh, as, as a professor at, in, at the seminary level for many, many years uh, in Philadelphia, now in Asbury, in, at Asbury Seminary in, in uh, Kentucky. Uh, and so it's great to have him here, but uh, I want you to know that he's, he's not just a, a world-class scholar, as I said before, he's, he's, a, he's a brother and, uh, and has a heart for, uh, for world mission. Uh, as, a, as a young man, about 25 years old, uh, he, took, he, he did a, a mission, a mission uh, to New York City, uh, he lived in uh, in the Brighton Beach area of Brooklyn, New York, and and had a ministry to the Jewish community there, the very large, uh, vibrant Jewish community in that in that area. And so, Doctor Doctor Keener comes to us as a man who has a real heart for for Israel and the Jewish people, and and loves uh, the the Jewish roots of our faith. And and so it's it's uh, for us and and who work in Jewish mission, it's wonderful and delightful to to have him with us and to be. To be sharing his his unique gifts uh, with us. So, without any further ado, I'm going to offer up a prayer and then invite uh, Dr. Keener to to come and uh, and lead us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for the chance for uh, for us to to sit uh, at, at your feet uh, and uh, to take in your the 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 rich uh, backgrounds of your Word, Lord, and and to understand them, and that we may be. We may be more fully equipped in our lives, Father, to not only to be um, uh, uh, to move in love and hope and peace and grace in our own lives, Father, but to share it with others, Lord, to to bring uh, the the love of Yeshua, the love of Jesus, Lord, to to other people, Father, as we are more and better equipped to do so, Father, through through training events like this today. Lord, we, we, we thank you, Father, for this time. Bless it now and use Dr. Keener in our lives, Father, to enrich us. And, and through us to enrich others. And we'll give you the glory for it. And we ask and pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen, Dr. Keener. All yours. Well, th thank you so much for that, Rich. And since you were talking about um, rich background and rich content, it just reaffirms what I said. They came <laughs> for you. You have, you have more hair than I do. So anyway, uh, uh, but... Yeah, I, I, I loved my time in New York. Um, it, was, it was all over the city. I mean, we were doing stuff in different places and I was assisting in a church in, in Queens, in Flushing. And, um, and then also um, 
Yeah, it just, it was so meaningful that I, as soon as I got the chance, I wanted to move to, uh, well, I, I, I didn't have an opening in New York, so I moved to Philadelphia and I spent 15 years there and uh, I miss I miss it. And of course, I've been praying for you guys in New York because I know you've been hit hard by um, the current uh, virus situation. Those of you who are listening to this as a rerun, hopefully it's all past then. Hopefully it hasn't come here instead. But anyway, um, I did I did want to uh, add one thing from from yesterday that I meant to mention, but I forgot when we were talking about the the law and so on, that the um, early early Messianic believers in Yerushalayim were uh, continuing to worship in the temple. Um, and uh, some of them had Nazarite vows, and Shaul, Paul, actually sponsored them uh, in those Nazarite vows. So just to say that th there was major continuity. So the first, the first believers saw themselves as uh, within a fulfillment of their Jewish heritage. And uh, the Gentile believers saw themselves as converts to a Jewish faith like uh, Paul describes it as branches being grafted in. So um, what evolved over history uh, due to actually disobeying what Paul said. I mean, Paul warned the Gentile branches not to boast against, against the Jewish branches. And when it evolved that, you know, Gentile Christendom said we've replaced Israel, that really, um, that really undermined the, the whole plan. I mean, Paul was in Romans 11, he was saying, you know, he wanted to make his, his, his own people jealous by saying, look, you know, you have this promise of the nations flowing into to Zion and worshiping the God of Israel. And now that's happening through faith in Yeshua. But then anti-Semitism uh, that the church absorbed from the pagan world around it really undercut that. So I hope it was all right for me to make that digression before I start, because uh, I tend to make my digressions after I start. And so <laughs> I thought I'd do one before I start. Anyway, that, that's left over from yesterday. But uh, the good news, according to John, which uh, really is the Greek word Ioannes, which is the Hebrew word Yochanan, uh, very good Jewish name is in Yochanan ben Zakkai, first century Jewish teacher. Well, it was a very common, common name in Judea and Galilee at that time. Most Johannine scholars, uh, I would say the strong majority of, of scholars who are focused on, on John, uh, both the gospel and, uh, and also the book of Revelation, although there's uh, scholars differ on how they relate the two. But most Johannine scholars believe that John's gospel addressed especially Jewish believers in Yeshua. Uh, I would add those would include Gentile believers would become part of the community, but again, saw themselves as converts to Judaism. I mean, if you're gonna not, you know, your, your men aren't gonna uh, commit what we call, uh, what we Christians and uh, traditional Christians and traditional Jews call sexual immorality. If, if, we're, if uh, the converts are, are going to adopt the Tanakh as their Bible, <laughs> if they're gonna believe in one God and in a, a Jewish Mashiach, uh, I mean, Gentiles didn't even know what Christos meant. They thought it was Jesus's last name, you know? So uh, they saw themselves as converts to a Jewish faith. There was no other way to see it in, in, that, in that context. In any case, some earlier writers doubted <clears throat> the, the Jewishness of Yochanan, of, of John, but the Dead Sea Scrolls pretty much shifted that after, after their discovery in the late 1940s. Uh, the light and darkness contrast that some people attributed in Gnosticism, which actually <laughs> isn't really attested as early as John's gospel anyway. But uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls showed that that contrast fits an ancient Jewish context actually better than others. You know, the, the children of light versus the children of darkness, um, some very similar language. The, the spirit of truth versus the spirit of error we have in 1 John 4. You know, it sounds like something straight out of Dead Sea Scrolls. The majority of scholars believe that the audience is especially Jewish believers kicked out of some synagogues. Now, this isn't likely true of all synagogues. I mean, if you look in, oh, if you look in Revelation, 
There are seven congregations that are addressed in, in these major cities. Um, Sardis, there's no mention of uh, persecution at all. Uh, and probably Sardis, everybody was pretty laid back. I mean, Sardis had a, a synagogue uh, that had a prime piece of real estate. It, it was about as large as, as a football field. <laughs> I mean, pretty, pretty huge, the largest one that's been discovered uh, in, within the bounds of the Roman Empire. And you know, it seems to be tolerated, and probably the, the Jewish believers were tolerated there. But in Smyrna and Philadelphia, there were conflicts. And uh, we may talk about that a little bit when we get to Revelation. But uh, John is probably addressing a similar audience to those in Smyrna and Philadelphia. Uh, and I'm sorry about my picture. I didn't have any picture of somebody getting kicked out of a synagogue or kicked out of anywhere else. So I had to make a composite. But anyway, uh, what about the focus of Yochanan's account about Yeshua? Well, at the very least, we're going to look at the introduction. We're going to look at uh, John 1, 1 through 18. The word became flesh. <clears throat> now, in Greek, it's logos. And Philo of Alexandria, first century Jewish philosopher, diaspora Jewish thinker, very popular, uh, was actually, um, Josephus talks about him as, as leader of the delegation to protest uh, Gaius's oppression of, of Jewish people. So very famous Jewish leader in the early first century. He integrates the logos of Stoic philosophy and uh, he integrates that with Platonism and with the Jewish motif of wisdom. So. There were thinkers and the Jewish thinkers in the diaspora who spoke of the logos and connected it with the Jewish understanding of divine wisdom. For most ancient Jewish people, including in Judea and Galilee, they would think of wisdom as something that was pre existent alongside God, uh, based on Proverbs. You also have it in Sirach, Wisdom of Solomon, and so forth. Um, and in, in Baruch, uh, this wisdom is identified, and, and also in the later rabbis. Wisdom is identified with the Torah. So um, when, when, when the gospel speaks of Yeshua in terms of wisdom, that was, the, that was the closest language. Wisdom or the word was the closest language that people had for speaking of somebody divine and yet distinct from the Father. I mean, they didn't have an exact wording for it, but that was the closest, the closest language that they, they had available for that. And as far as the you know, the word being being identified with the Torah. I mean, you've already got that, say, in Psalm 119, uh, but it's developed a lot in, in later sources. And so we're going to see an emphasis on that as Yeshua, as the Torah in the flesh. You know, if these, if, if these believers are being kicked out of synagogues, uh, some synagogues, and they're being told by, by uh, some, some of the teachers, well, you know, you, don't, you just don't know the Torah. That's why you follow this. No, actually, we do know the Torah. We know the Torah in person. Uh, and, and that seems to be part of their answer. And, and again, I don't want to make it like all synagogues would do that. Certainly all synagogues aren't like that today. I, I, uh, I mentioned yesterday, I attended a reform synagogue in one place. I attended a conservative synagogue in another place. I was very graciously received. And uh, a friend of mine who was a Jewish believer was attending an Orthodox uh, service there and just just reciting, I couldn't keep up with the Hebrew when I went with him, but, uh, but you know, one day somebody noticed he had Yeshua on his kippah, and he said, what's that about? And he said, oh, that's Yeshua, he's, he's the Jewish Mashiach. And he said, that's interesting, but, you know, he didn't get thrown out. It was, <laughs> uh, things can be more gracious today. It depends on, depends on locality. But anyway, um, John 1, 14 through 18, the word became flesh and made his dwelling or literally in Greek, he tabernacled among us. We've beheld his glory. And, and this glory is full of grace and truth. The Torah was given through Moshe. Grace and truth came through Yeshua, the Messiah. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Now, what he's doing here, he's alluding to the first giving of God's word on Mount Sinai. Israel sinned with the golden calf in Exodus 32. It was, uh, it was such an embarrassment that 
I mean, Josephus actually leaves the incident out in recounting Israel's history. But anyway, they sinned with the golden calf and Moses smashed the tablets, Exodus 32. Well, then he needed some more. So he went back up on Mount Sinai and God said, Moses, I'm not going to dwell with Israel. And Moses said, God, please. Uh, and God said, Moses, you're my friend, but you know, I, I'm really upset with my people right now. And Moses said, God, if I'm your friend, then I ask you, show me your glory. And God said, nobody can see all of my glory and live, but I'll show you part of my glory. And when it, when it says he showed him his glory, it says, I believe it's Exodus 33, 18, I'll make my goodness pass before you. So he's just going to show him his heart, his character. And as, as the Lord passes before Moses, there's this cosmic spectacle of fireworks. But more than that, God is revealing his character. And so as the Lord passes before Moses, he says, the Lord, the Lord, gracious and merciful, the Lord who, who visits the iniquity, uh, punishes the sin of the, uh, of the parents upon the children of the third and fourth generation, but whose chesed, his covenant love, is to the thousandth generation of those who fear him and keep his commandments. Now, this abounding in love and covenant faithfulness uh, if you're translating it into Greek, you could say something like uh, plures, uh, karitas, kai, uh, aletheia, uh, full of grace and truth. Uh, that's language that's similar to the language that's used in the, in the Greek translation of the Tanakh uh, for this phrase that's often repeated, but especially in, in, this, in this context. Uh, well, after God reveals his heart to Moses, Moses says, all right, God, if that's the way you are, then please forgive us and dwell with us. And the Lord says, I will. Well, um, some 1300 years later, depending on when you date the Exodus, uh, this becomes the background for John 1, 14 through 18. God Gate was giving his word, his Torah, uh, or the, the foundation for it on Mount Sinai. But now the word has come again. Um, God dwelt with Israel. Well, again, God dwells among his people, John 1, 14. Moses beholds the, the glory. John says, we beheld his glory. The glory was full of grace and truth, was abounding in covenant love and covenant faithfulness. Rav Chesed Ve'emet. And now again, the glory is full of grace and truth. No one can see God at any time. Well, he says the same thing in, in verse 18 of John 1. No one has beheld God at any time. But now he's, he's revealed in the Messiah. Well, how do we know that this is the right background? If we had one or two points of contact, we might be guessing, which is what people often do. But here we have multiple points of contact with this passage. So it's pretty clear that, that this introduction to John's gospel is alluding to that. I mean, he also speaks of how um, uh, Isaiah saw his glory in chapter 12. He talks about Abraham saw his day in chapter eight. Well, here's where Moses saw his glory. And then the climax of John's prologue compares Yeshua and the Torah. He says, the law came through Moses, and he doesn't have a but, <laughs> but uh, I guess I'll say but because I, I want to make a comparison. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Yeshua the Messiah. Well, grace and truth were already there in the Torah. I mean, it's, it's, it's explicit, abounding in covenant love and covenant faithfulness. God forgiving his people, God blessing his people with so much more love and mercy than with judgment. But how is it fuller than in Yeshua? Remember, Moses could see only part of God's glory. But in Yeshua, we see God's heart fully unveiled because we see a God who loves his people so much that God would be willing to suffer pain in the place of his people. Think of Hosea chapter 11. In Hosea 11, 
God is pronouncing judgment. He says, I, I brought you out of Egypt, but, but no, I'm going, to, I'm going to send you off into exile, not, not Egypt this time, but Assyria. He will be your king. And then God's heart breaks in the midst of this. And God says, oh, Ephraim, how can I do this to you? How can I make you like Adma and, and Zeboim? These were uh, two cities that were overturned with Sodom and Gomorrah in the book of Genesis. How can I make you like these cities that according to Deuteronomy, God overturned in his anger and kindled the fire upon in his wrath? Well, Hosea 11, my own heart is overturned within me and all my compassions are kindled, which is to say, my people, if I could, I would take this judgment in your place. Such love that God has for his people. And we see it expressed, this, this continuity, the same covenant love that's expressed in the mission of Yeshua the Messiah. Um, <clears throat> and going beyond even what people would probably expect the Mashiach to do, except for passages like, you know, Isaiah 9 and so on, which uh, speak of, of God himself coming, but uh, I need to move on. So what does it mean that he saw, uh, they, they saw God's glory in Yeshua? Well, you trace that theme through the rest of, of the gospel of Yohanan. Um, Yeshua reveals his glory in many ways through different signs and so on, but especially when he's executed in the tree, he, he says that the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And so his glory is especially expressed in the place where, where God's heart is especially revealed. So at the place where we humans were Pounding the nails in his hands. I mean, technically it was the Romans, but it stands for all of us because it's our sins that nailed him. At the very place where, where we were pounding the nails in his hands by our sins, he was crying out, I love you. I love you. I love you. And there we see God's heart. And we look at what God sacrificed for our sake. Now, I want to look at the theme of the Ruach HaKodesh, uh, especially through the theme of water, Ma'im, in, in John's Gospel. John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. On the last and greatest day of the feast, and you know from 7-2, this is the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, Yeshua stood and cried loudly, If anyone's thirsty, let them come to me. Let them drink, whoever believes in me. As the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from their belly. Now there's different ways to punctuate that. I'm punctuating it uh, the way the earliest Greek interpreters did as opposed to the way the earliest Latin interpreters did. But anyway, uh, verse 39 says that when he's talking about these rivers of living water, by this he meant the spirit. Again, we, we mentioned this yesterday, um, all these promises in, in the prophets about the outpouring of the spirit in the, in the end time. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given. Not that nobody was touched by the spirit, but the outpouring of the spirit hadn't happened since Yeshua had not yet been glorified. Well, this reflects a motif that runs throughout this book. In, in John 1, Yochanan, the immerser says, I immerse in water. But among you stands one whom you don't recognize, and he will immerse you in the Ruach HaKodesh. So Yeshua is greater than Yochanan the Immerser. It's not bad and good, it's good and better. Yeshua is greater than Yochanan the Immerser. And then water turned to wine. Uh, the, these uh, six stone water pots set aside for purification in John chapter two and verse six. Well, the reason they used stone was that was not able to contract ritual impurity. You didn't have to break it afterwards. And uh, we, see, we see that uh, both in the uh, Jewish sources and archeologically. So they had these ritual water pots, but by using the water pots for something else, Yeshua makes secondary their ritual function 
and he values instead the persons, uh, the, the, the bride and the groom who are gonna be uh, embarrassed, uh, probably the laughing stock of their village of Cana, well, Cana was actually a fairly sizable town in the, at this point, um, gonna, gonna make them a laughing stock if, you know, they, you were supposed to often have wedding feasts for seven days. So if you think it's hard today to prepare for, uh, you know, wedding reception, just think about having enough wine to last seven days. Anyway, Yeshua turns the water into, into wine. Uh, some people would probably like that gift today, but John chapter three and verse five, born from water and the spirit. Now, uh, Nicodemus is trying to grapple with what Jesus is, is saying to him. Nicodemus maybe knocked him on Ben-Gurion in, in the Talmud, uh, but in any case, his name would be knocked him on. Uh, and Nicodemus is saying, uh, well, how can this happen? Uh, how can I, I receive the, the spirit the way you're talking about? How can I be born anew or literally born from above? Gentiles converting to Judaism were immersed in water. Uh, that was to wash away their ritual impurity. And when a Gentile converted to Judaism, when they became a proselyte, they were counted as a newborn child. And when Yeshua says, Nicodemus, you have to be born from water and the spirit, he may speak of a spiritual proselyte immersion, that is immersion in the spirit. Uh, remember what, what he said back in chapter seven, in, in, we talked about earlier. In chapter seven, he speaks of, this, of, of uh, rivers of living water. And he says, this he spoke of concerning the spirit. That would fit what you have in Ezekiel uh, 36, where God will put a new spirit within his people and put his spirit within them. Uh, the chapter right after that is Ezekiel 37. For those of you who are good with math, the chapter right after. Uh, well, right after Yeshua talks about being born of water and the spirit, he speaks of the sound of uh, the voice of the spirit or the sound of the wind. You could translate it either way. Uh, in Ezekiel 37, the, the, the wind, the breath of God, the Ruach brings, brings new life. So uh, born from water and of the spirit. In Greek, water here, uh, well, the, the word and, the word chi, can either mean two separate things or it can be used epexegetically as a hendiades. You're saying, what in the world is he talking about? What, well, sometimes it can mean water that is the spirit, water symbolizing the spirit. So he may be speaking of a spiritual proselyte immersion. Chapter, chapter four um, talks about living water. Yeshua offers holy water better than the water of Jacob's well that was considered holy to the Samaritans. And he also brings a true worship more enduring than that of Jerusalem or the Samaritans Mount Gerizim. Uh, the Samaritans were so insistent on you know, their, their site being holy and so upset with, with uh, Judeans having this temple in Jerusalem. They actually tried to desecrate the temple in Jerusalem and Judeans actually destroyed the Samaritan temple <laughs> on Mount Gerizim. But um, Samaritans in their version of the Ten Commandments, they actually included in there, you have to worship on Mount Gerizim. <laughs> so there was this big thing about the, these different holy sites and Yeshua is saying, when, when she says, hey, you know, I'm, I'm excluded, I can't come to Jerusalem. So what, is, what good is it if you're the restorer? Uh, it's no help to us. Uh, so he, he says, I'm telling you, there's a time coming when it's neither gonna be in Yerushalayim nor in this mountain. Of course, he's not speaking of the new Jerusalem, but you know, the time is coming when the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed. And it was something that Yeshua mourned uh, I mean, he talks about the abomination of desolation using the language of, of Daniel elsewhere uh, in, in Mark 13, 14, and in uh, Matthew 24, 15. Uh, you know, and, he, and he, he wanted to cleanse the temple of ritual impurity, like, like some other people who were very passionate about the purity of the temple. So it's not against the Jerusalem temple, but there was a time coming when people wouldn't be worshiping in the Jerusalem temple. There's no, you know, the temple was destroyed on Mount Gerizim. 
that Yeshua is saying, the place where you can always worship is in the spirit. And again, maybe another Hindiades in the, in the spirit of truth. So um, by the Ruach HaKodesh, we can offer God worship that is truly worthy to him. In, in chapter five, Yeshua does what the pool of Bethesda couldn't do. Many people resorted to healing shrines with, with pools. Um, and, and there's some archeological evidence that suggests that some people used the, the pool of Bethesda in this way. But Yeshua is greater than the waters of popular superstition. And the Pharisees would have considered that popular superstition. Uh, but Yeshua is greater than those waters too, the holy water <laughs> on the popular level. Uh, and you can contrast the, the man here with the man at the pool of Siloam in, in John chapter nine. Um, you have two pools. In one, the man has been infirm for 38 years. The other has been infirm from birth. One case, Yeshua says, sin no more. The other case, Yeshua says, neither is this man's sin nor his parents. In the one case, the man apparently betrays Yeshua to please the authorities. And the other, the man endures being expelled from the synagogue and refuses to betray Yeshua. And uh, th this is just, uh, you can see, uh, these again are from Todd Bolin. You can see the pool of Siloam there in this uh, Jerusalem model uh, that actually is in Jerusalem. And uh, you can also see the, the, the general area. This is actually an excavation of where the pool of Siloam was. Uh, and it doesn't, they didn't go all the way down, but you can see it was rather massive. <laughs> a lot of people were bathing in the pool of Siloam. Y Yeshua works through the pool of Siloam. So, you know, he doesn't need ritual water in some cases, but in this case, he works through the water. He's not against it. Siloam's water was used in a special ritual for the festival of Sukkot, the tabernacles. Um, and Yeshua healed the man on the final day of the festival. So um, many scholars again think that some of John's audience may have been kicked out of their synagogues so they can really identify with, with this guy. Actually, before I go on to the next one, let me say something more about this. For, for seven days, priests would, would march from the Pool of Siloam uh, in, in a public procession to the, the temple um, and, and they would pour out water uh, at, the, at the base of the altar in the temple. So this was a well-known festival and the relation between Siloam and the Feast of Sukkot was, was very prominent. In fact, they found a, a, a souvenir amphorisk from a, a pilgrim from Sukkot uh, in Jerusalem. They found it as far away as Cyprus from a diaspora Jew. And in chapter 13, Yeshua washes the disciples' feet. And, and the passage goes back and forth between Yeshua serving his disciples and announcing that one of them was going to betray him. And the foot washing symbolized what Yeshua's death would fulfill, serving even to the point of death as the suffering servant. So going back to, to John chapter seven, this is the last day of the Feast of Sukkot. For seven days, priests brought water from Siloam to the temple. The public ritual symbolized their hope in the future waters that would flow from the temple. They called the foundation of their temple the belly or the navel of the earth. Uh, of course, that, that goes even back to Ezekiel, but it was is very prominent in literature this period. Um, two centuries earlier, the Book of Jubilees, and uh, just you know, prominent in rabbinic literature. The, the temple is the navel of the earth. Greeks said Delphi was the navel of the earth. Romans maybe thought of Rome as the center of the earth, all roads led there, but for Jewish people, now the navel of the earth, the belly of the earth is Jerusalem and the temple there. And that's gonna make sense of, of Yeshua saying, as the scripture said, from his belly shall flow rivers of living water, summarizing the message. Priests read from Ezekiel 47 and Zechariah 14 on the last day of this festival. Uh, this is recorded in the Tosefta and we have other supporting evidence. Both passages spoke of living water gushing from Jerusalem or from the temple 
in the last days. And so this really fits. Um, Yeshua speaks of the scripture where waters go forth from the belly, from the temple, that is, in Ezekiel 47. Yeshua claims to be the foundation stone of God's new temple. Now, this would be really relevant to Jewish believers after 70, cut off from the temple, just like all other Jewish people were cut off from the temple. Uh, but yeah, Yeshua is the foundation stone of a spiritual temple, and from him flows the water of the river of life. Let the one who will come and drink freely. And, and you, come to, you come to a climax of this motif in John chapter 19 and verse 34, which uh, Yochanan is adamant that he's a witness of this. One of the soldiers pierced Yeshua's side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Now, in terms of, of medical understanding today, we would say, okay, the, the spear pierced, pierced the part of pericardial sac around the heart. And so a watery substance as well as blood was released. But there's a special reason why Yochanan uh, alone records this. I mean, the other gospels, they don't make a big deal about that. They've got other things to record, but the Yochanan wants to emphasize this because it, it's a fitting climax for his water motif. That now finally, as Yeshua is crowned King of the Jews, as he's enthroned on a tree of sacrifice, from his, his belly flow, flows water. Now, uh, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Uh, should I go on with something else in Yochanan, or uh, is this time for me to, to give you a, I, I, I can, okay, 10, okay, I will, yeah, thanks. So, I don't know if some of you have heard, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That one gets taken out of context a lot. People say, that's the devil. Uh, well, uh, the devil does come to do those things. Those of us who believe in the devil recognize that. But the context of John chapter 10, those of you who are good with math, the preceding chapter is chapter nine. And in chapter nine, Yeshua is defending this blind man against the elite who have expelled him from the synagogue. Um, and uh, you, you have the, the three characters or sets of characters, Yeshua is defending the blind man, the formerly blind man. <laughs> you have the, the elite who expelled the blind man formerly blind man, and you have the formerly blind man. Well, in, in John chapter 10, he's, he, you know, at the end of chapter, chapter 9, he's, he's still defending the guy, uh, going straight into chapter 10. In chapter 10, he talks about the good shepherd who risks his life for the sheep and confronts the wolves and the robbers. This formerly blind man is an example of one of Yeshua's sheep, and the thieves and the robbers and the wolves are the people who are pushing him out. In light of the Tanakh, uh, the, the local elite are like the false shepherds of Ezekiel 34 and Jeremiah 23. They're the, the corrupt leaders who lead God's people astray. Um, and we know a lot about the corrupt leaders. Uh, if you, uh, I think I, I mentioned yesterday about the, uh, the Sanhedrin put in power originally by uh, that particular Sanhedrin was put in power by Herod the Great, who was corrupt himself and one of the people who were his supporters. And they're complained about by everybody, uh, every other Jewish source from the period. So uh, there were some people who didn't, didn't like the elite and thought that they were corrupt. But anyway, um, Yeshua is the good shepherd. While the shepherd in the Tanakh is often Moses or David is the shepherd of God's people, and especially the Lord, the Lord is my shepherd, especially in Ezekiel 34 and Jeremiah 23, uh, where it speaks of the false shepherds, and the Lord himself says he will, he will replace them. And then the formerly blind man is an example of one of Yeshua's sheep. Well, the sheep in the Tanakh were God's people. And so Yeshua is saying, I don't care what they say, you do belong to my people. So. Um, they can hold on to their heritage. Shepherds kept sheep in the fold at night to protect them from predators like thieves, robbers, wolves, and he doesn't mention to hear lions. Yeshua says, my sheep know my voice. 
which is language that's, of course, borrowed from the Torah, where Adonai says, um, you know, calls his Torah his voice, talks of his people, giving heed to his voice. Yeshua even compares our relationship with him, his relationship with the Father in 10, 14 through 15. Um, my own will know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And throughout this gospel, Yeshua models a relationship with the Father. So, you know, you've got uh, religious people, and this happens in every religion. It happens in, uh, well, I don't know if it happens in every denomination, but sooner or later, it usually happens in, in denominations. Um, it just, it's, yeah, leaders often become more committed to the system than they are to intimacy with the God they serve. But Yeshua is talking about a personal relationship with him. You know that you know because you actually experience the presence and the voice of God. You may not feel that all the time, but you've had an experience of a relationship with God, and that makes all the difference in the world. I was talking with uh, um, a Shiite Muslim one time, and, and we, were, we were dialoguing at length, friend, very, very friendly dialogue, and he was telling me that he didn't, um, you know, he was saying that you know, he believed in prophets. Uh, after, after Yeshua, he said, you know, Jesus is a prophet, Moses was a prophet, but we believe Muhammad was a prophet. And I said, well, I don't believe prophecy stopped with, with Jesus. I mean, you've got uh, prophets in the book of Acts and so on. And, um, and actually, it talks about the continuing of the spirit. And he was nodding. And I said, yes. Uh, and in fact, uh, I, I talked also about, you know, he was saying the original, uh, the original message of Jesus would have been in Arabic. And I said, well, not exactly Arabic. But he probably spoke Aramaic. It was pretty close uh, to Hebrew and to, to Arabic. And he's like, okay, that's good. And I said, yeah, and actually we have some of the Aramaic words preserved. He said, very good. And I said, like one of them is Abba. And he was shocked because of course that means Papa. And God has no son <laughs> in his theology. And I said, no, uh, he, had, he had this intimate relationship with God. And he's given me the spirit. And I have this relationship with God. And the spirit causes me to cry, Abba. And he was so shocked about this idea about having an intimate and personal relationship with God. God is so far above. Well, God is so far above. But the God of mercy and grace has chosen to come to dwell with us, to give us his spirit. Anyway, uh, elsewhere in this book, because the Ruach HaKodesh, a promised end time gift to God's people, um, Joel chapter two or three, if you're reading it in Hebrew uh, or the Septuagint, I think in um, Isaiah 42, Isaiah 44, Isaiah 59, Isaiah 61, Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 39, Zechariah 14. This this promise of the gift of the Spirit, and in the in the Brit Hadashah, this is a a marker of those who belong to God. It, it this this relationship that that we have with God through the spirit is uh, showing that the new covenant has been inaugurated, uh, or, or at least we have a foretaste. We, we don't have the consummation of everything, but we, we've begun to experience this. Um, now, I could go on to John 3.16, but that would just be fun. I think, I'm, I think I, uh, it's my time. I'm supposed to hand it back to, to Rich. Oh, oh. You, are you serious? I can have more? Thanks. Okay, five more minutes. Um, has anybody heard of John 3.16? I see all the hands going up. Actually, I can't see anything, but I, I, I trust that some of your hands went up. Um, it speaks of eternal life, which literally is the life of the age, uh, which was shorthand in, in Jewish teaching for the life of the coming age. It appears often in ancient Jewish literature. It's a promise for the future after the resurrection of the righteous. The phrase goes back to Daniel chapter 12 and verse two. Um, the Pharisees rightly uh, recognized in that passage, uh, future resurrection. Well, in, in Yohanan, it begins when one is born from the spirit. You already begin, you already enter that 
life of the coming age. There's the foretaste of the kingdom already is inaugurated in your life. So we could approach this verse various ways, like God so loved the world, well, or God loved the world in this way. Who is the world? And you could trace that theme through, through the gospel. We could focus on the issue of God's love, which was very emphasized, well, very emphasized towards Israel, especially in, in uh, ancient Jewish literature, sometimes toward the world, but especially towards Israel. Um, and we could develop that in, in the gospel, but let's focus on whoever believes in him. What does that mean? Uh, somebody says, well, I, I believe he was a good man. I believe he was a prophet. Uh, what, what kind of faith is he really calling for? And this actually goes beyond what a lot of people are comfortable with. But anyway, uh, what kind of faith is he talking about? Well, at Pesach, he's in Yerushalayim. Many saw the signs he did. They believed in him, but Yeshua wouldn't believe in them, wouldn't entrust himself to them. It wasn't full-fledged faith. Uh, but as the, as the gospel moves on, you, you get different models of faith and lack of faith. And Thomas says, unless I see him and put my hands in the nail prints, I'm not going to believe. Well, Yeshua shows up and says to Thomas, okay, now you can stop doubting and believe. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. This is a non-negotiable in John's gospel. Then Yeshua told him, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So he counts Thomas's confession is faith. Part of recognizing uh, faith in terms of what John's gospel demands is recognizing that Yeshua is Lord. Um, and, and then he says, uh, now these, these signs are written for those of you who haven't seen, didn't get the advantage Thomas got, but through believing in the accounts of of an eyewitness, the beloved disciple, uh, or other early eyewitnesses, you may believe, and believing, you may have life in his name. And this is the climactic confession in the gospel. I mean, the word was, was divine, John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.18, uh, framing the introduction. Uh, Yochanan the Immerser, John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God, John 1.29. Later in John chapter one, um, Nathaniel, uh, a genuine Israelite in whom is no guile, confesses Yeshua as son of God, king of Israel. Shimon Peter in chapter six, you're the holy one of God. But then Thomas, you know, this is the climactic confession. So uh, this is just out in the open. Also, the faith needs to be faith that perseveres. It's not just like, oh yeah, I, I prayed once and then you know, now I'm a Buddhist uh, uh, or now, I, now, I, uh, now I'm an atheist, but I, I used to believe. No, um, even as he spoke, many put their faith in him, but he said, if you continue in my teaching, then you're really my disciples. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. I mean, it doesn't mean that a person never wavers or something, but you know, if you become an atheist, you're not really a believer at that point. So, uh, but you're welcome back anyway. So he talks about persevering faith. And this is something both Calvinists and Arminians agree upon uh, that faith needs to persevere um, without getting into the, the nitty gritty details. So um, this is a picture of outer darkness with wailing and gnashing of teeth, if you can see it. No, uh, this is where my screen went blank because that's the end of what I was gonna do on this. Uh, to give time for revelation. So uh, handing it back to you, Rich. Into um, the Q&A time for the first session. And we have a whole bunch of questions here lined up for us. And uh, so um, you're all uh, uh, finished uh, with your little break here. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do a Q&A for about 25 minutes, and then we're gonna break again for 10 minutes. And then we'll come back for the final session with Dr. Keener in the book of the Revelation. Uh, so let's say we're going to begin with this one, uh, Dr. Keener. Um, let's try to do uh, no more than five minutes for each question. All right, so we'll, we'll keep it <laughs> so we can get through some of these questions. If we can get through five questions, that'd be great. Um, if John was calling Yeshua the Torah in John chapter one, 
why did he use logos instead of graphe and nomos and, and nomos or nomos? Um, and then a follow up to that is did Yeshua, oh, okay, I guess I'm gonna stop there. So if John was used, was calling Yeshua the Torah in John chapter one, why did he use logos instead of graphe or nomos? Uh, you're, you're, you're muted, Dr. Dr. Keener. No, I don't see how to. Yeah, okay. You're there. I'm there. Okay. Yeah. Um, you, usually the question is, why didn't he use Sophia for wisdom? And scholars often say, well, because Sophia was, was feminine. I'm not sure that that's the, the reason. But, um, but Logos, or the word, was kind of the one way to bring together uh, all these different concepts of wisdom and Torah. Because um, logos, and logos was all also used um, by Philo of Alexandria. It was it was just in common use for uh, the concept. Stoics spoke of logos as the organizing principle for for matter. They didn't actually have a creation, so to speak. But again, it was just um, kind of a catch-all way of encompassing a lot of different things. But the namas or, or the Torah was considered to be God's logos, his word. And you can see it all coming together um, between the allusions to Exodus 33 and 34, where the law comes uh, as, as God's word, and the, uh, the climax in verse 17, the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came i.e. more fully, um, not, not in a veiled way, but more fully through Yeshua the Messiah. Okay, thank you. I think that, that's, that's great. Um, so the second question is, did Yeshua offer sacrifices at the temple? For example, Thanksgiving offerings. I, I would assume so. Okay. Did it make it in, in my five minutes on that one? Yeah, you, you just, <laughs> just enable us to ask an extra question. Uh, so, so yeah, yeah, do you want to follow up with that? Is is uh, is that controversial? Is the, is is the I fact know, that he would? I, it shouldn't be controversial. I mean, in Luke chapter two, it says that his parents offered the the sacrifices required by the law of Moses. So, I don't see why it would be controversial that Yeshua did the same. I mean, maybe not on the visit where he's, so to speak, cleansing the temple, but I mean, probably on the normal basis he did. Okay. Well, that, 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 that's interesting. I guess, I guess it does open up some, some questions, but, uh, but it's true. He, was a, he keeps the law. He keeps the law fully, you know, uh, for us. Okay, good. Yeah, Galatians um, 3, 4, born, born, yeah. born under the law, yeah. He pretty perfectly keeps the law for us. Yeah, amen. Okay, so uh, the, the third question, um, what Jewish ritual purification does John 2, 5 refer to? What are the, what are the jars used for? Uh, where is that in the Torah? Uh, that one is not in the Torah. <laughs> um, it, it was a, a new thing that was coming about maybe in the first century. Um, now, when I wrote my big commentary on John, I was arguing that these were, uh, these were used for mikvah because you've got, um, they, they provide enough water altogether for a mikvah tank. But, I struggled with that. I had to say that they weren't very orthodox because, you know, mikvah can't be drawn water. <laughs> it, you, you, can't, you can't have it in jars and then pour it into something. That's not mikvah. Um, and you have mikvah oats from all over the place, including around Cana, where people, you know, they, they step down into the immersion pool and uh, you have water maybe from a cistern with a conduit. You can refill the pool that way or you use rainwater, but you can't use drawn water. I've pretty much changed my mind since then. I think it was the, the uh, use for hand washing, especially you know, if you're gonna have a, a festival, uh, no, not a festival, a wedding feast, uh, you're gonna need to do a lot of hand washing since you're gonna be washing before the, before the meals. Some people have argued that, well, look, our earliest attestation for that is 
is later, but then our earliest attestation for the stone vessels is later uh, in terms of written sources, because most of our written sources are later, but archeologically it's well attested. So um, it's often thought that it originated, well, either in the diaspora, because in the diaspora there was hand washing before prayer um, in an earlier period, or it originated with the Pharisees who said, we need ritual purity, you know, the priests have to, uh, be cleansed in the temple. Uh, we need to do that with regard to eating food in a pure state. So there are different debates on exactly how and when it started, but it's, it's already referred to in, in Mark chapter 7 as something that uh, was a widespread practice, probably speaking of hyperbolically, but a widespread practice. Mark was from Judea. He, he would know he would know it wasn't something that just was introduced in recent years. So, you know, we do have some literary evidence uh, for, the, for the practice of hand washing before meals uh, already by this period. And that's probably what it was. Makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Um, let's, let's go to um, uh, question number four. Some people say that, that God is an autocratic God who demands worship and punishes mistakes. We love God because he first loved us. But how can I answer the question of why did God create us and why does he want our praise and worship? Wow, this is a, this is a foundational radical question. Yes, and I'm thinking of, of two levels of answer to that. And if I forget, I am an absent-minded professor, so you may have to remind me of the thrust of the question halfway through, but, um, but already in the Torah, um, like well, in 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 the Tanakh, in the in the prophets, for example, uh, Jeremiah. My people have committed two great evils. They've uh, they've they they've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've dug out for themselves cisterns or water tanks, broken water tanks that can hold no water. Or in Hosea, God says, "My people." you're against me, against your help. It's for our good too. I mean, we need God. We are finite. What, what, what are we without God? All the blessings we have are from God. And so if we're against God, if, if ultimately he hands us over to what we want, apart from God, apart from all his blessings, that kind of alienation would be, that would just be awful. <laughs> um, and the Bible has language for that. But um, in terms of the other, uh, why, why would God create us? I'm, I'm just leaving aside all the questions of um, how old the universe is and how God did it and so on. It looks to me, uh, and actually this, the Stoics thought this too, and, and uh, Judaism has historically thought this, but... Um, it looks to me like God designed the universe so that life could exist, which suggests to me that God really wanted life to exist, wanted human life to exist. And so it suggests to me a God of love who actually would be involved in history, which certainly fits um, scripture and climaxes, I believe, in a God who cared for us so much that he would step into history himself and, and bring us to himself. And so what we have with Yeshua, this is, this is a God of such love that he would endure even the, the ultimate agony. Now, do I have time to tell a story? Yes, this is a big question, go ahead. Okay. Okay, this, some people will not like me after hearing the story, but it's worth it if I can communicate a point uh, to other people. My, my, uh, my, my wife, my loving, wonderful wife today is not the one this story is about, um, but 15 years before I married her, I was abandoned by my first wife. 
she ran off with her best friend's husband. And um, it, it, it's all forgiven now, but I'm just telling this as a, uh, uh, it, is a way of saying, I, I, I fought the divorce. She wanted to divorce me so she could marry her friend's husband who had just divorced his wife because of the, uh, he wanted to marry my wife. So I, I fought the divorce for a couple of years. And in fighting the divorce, I, uh, you know, day after day, the, the pain of rejection was just so great. And I kept loving despite the pain of rejection. The pain of wounded love is, is a lot, but I could endure it as long as I had hope that she might return. But eventually, you know, under, under law, you know, there's only so many years you can fight it, <laughs> even uh, on the grounds of, well, the, the, the only grounds at that point would have been, uh, since I wasn't the one filing, the only grounds would have been uh, two years physical separation. So I fought it as long as I could, but when there was no hope of her coming back, the pain would have just been masochism. <laughs> the, the pain of rejected love eventually had to say enough. I, I have to let go. It didn't mean I stopped loving, but I had to let go. And God's love is so great that he was willing to endure the pain of rejected love. He was willing to endure even the pain of Yeshua being nailed to the tree of sacrifice so that we could be restored to him. But if despite that pain, we continue to reject his love, eventually there comes a time when God says enough. And I believe that happens when we die. God has given us so many chances in this life to engage his love the, the the signs of his blessing all around us, the air that we get to breathe, the, you know, our health isn't always perfect, but the fact that we have any health, the fact that we have life to begin with, these are God's gifts. And eventually God says, enough. It's the enough of the broken heart of rejected love. Dr. Keener, thank you so much for being so transparent. Um, and, and that answer, it's a powerful answer. It's a, it's a really big question, you know, and with a lot of different aspects to it, but, uh, but you've answered it beautifully and powerfully and personally. So thank you. Thank you very much for doing that. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's move on to the next, the next question. Um, and, uh, let's see, number four, what, uh, some people, okay. Uh, okay. Could you discuss why faith that is pistis, uh, never occurs in John? while the verb trust uh, slash believe is consistently used. How does this faith expressed in action impact our understanding of our walk with Messiah? Yeah. Um, it's possible to make lexical fallacies if we, if we weigh too much on certain things, but uh, it, is, it is significant. John also never uses, um, he, he he likes he likes the verbs. It is pistuo. It is believe. Uh, the same with the knowledge of God, which is in knowing God. That's that's also an extremely prominent verb in the gospel. You've got gnosko. You've got oida. Two different two different words for that. But you never have the noun. <laughs> you never have gnosis, which is which is one argument against you know the. You know, this being something reacting against later Gnosticism, John never even uses the noun. Um, and agape, uh, he, may, he may use that, I don't recall. I think you've got it in First John anyway, but uh, big preference to uh, agapao and phileo, to the verbs for, for love, which I think he, he, he usually uses pretty much interchangeably. It's my opinion from having gone through the the different references in the in the in the gospel, um, because uh, variation was well, it kept it kept the writing lively. It was a standard practice in ancient writing and speaking. Um, but yeah, it it has to be an action. 
and even even going back to to three sixteen, um, this we uh, a lot of our translations say God so loved the world, and we think God loved so much, and there is biblical precedent for understanding God. This is how much God loved the world, but actually the Greek word that's used there doesn't mean so much. It means this is how God loved the world. God loved the world by giving his son. So it was, it was love, as the, as the questioner said, in action. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's, uh, it, so there's a dis distinction between the, the, uh, the, the word, uh, uh, the noun, and, and then the, uh, the way that John is using it. He doesn't use pistis, but he, but he uses the verb for, for so, the, so the, the, the questioner saying that this is, this is faith in action, that John is, his, he, he sees a, a sort of a different aspect of faith uh, going on here in John, different from the, the synoptics. I don't know if I would, I don't know how much I would say that. Um, it is persevering faith. It is faith in, in Yeshua as Lord. Uh, and he does underline Yeshua's exalted status more consistently than the synoptics do, although it, it's already there in the synoptics. I mean, <laughs> Mark chapter one, you've got um, you know him quoting Malachi and Isaiah for uh, preparing the way for Adonai. You know, in, in Hebrew, it's clear this is the Tetragrammaton, and and then immediately you have. Uh, John the Baptist, Yochanan the Immerser, preparing the way for Yeshua and dressed as Elijah in 2 Kings 1.8. Uh, so, I mean, right at the opening, it, it's clear Mark knows what he's doing. Yeshua is the fulfillment of, of this uh, promise of uh, the Lord bringing his people back to, to Zion. The, uh, you know, it's, it's a fulfillment of of the Lord stepping into history, and uh, but but John is much more explicit about it, and much more, much less subtle about it. Uh, so the the object of of faith is maybe clearer, but I think in all of them, the idea of believe involves trust, a personal trust. There's a commitment aspect to it. There's a faithfulness dimension to it. I think all of those are are contained in um, in in the idea of, of faith and the or, or believing in the Brit Hadasha. Uh, John actually has levels of believing. You have people who believe because they saw a sign, but they don't persist in believing. So he's he's calling us to this deeper level of trust. Uh, so I guess in that way. You know, having the two levels, maybe he goes beyond. I'm trying to think if the synoptics do that. Um, the synoptics also you have, like, in Mark 15, uh, come down, and so that we may see and believe. Uh, and but that's not acceptable kind of faith. Anyway. Okay. Good. I, I have a, a hot question here from 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 a, a messianic Jewish perspective. Um, is is John commonly misunderstood to be anti-Semitic and hostile hostile to Judaism today? How do you address that? In, how do you address that in your outreach? Yeah, John is is very commonly understood that way, uh, and in a sense for good reason because John has been used that way through so much of history. That's why it's really important, and that's why Johanna and scholars emphasize the point that that wasn't the original context in which John was written. That wasn't John's purpose. And to read John that way is to read John in an anachronistic way that really scholars need to work to counter and teach Gentile believers as, as well as Jewish believers, no, don't, <laughs> don't use John this way. It's, it's a misappropriation. Um, one of the things, and I dealt with this in my dissertation, uh, I, dealt I dealt with uh, the introduction in terms of the Torah um, and a lot of other things. And 
scholars have been dealing with these things for a long time. One of the issues that's been debated is the language of hoi eudaioi in Greek, the, the Jews. And if you go through the gospel, with the exception of John chapter 6, that's almost exclusively used for Judeans as opposed to Galileans, both of whom were Jewish, obviously. Um, and it's almost exclusively used, well, a little bit less, but it's primarily used for the Judean elite, not, not for all Jewish people. Consistently in, in John's gospel, even in Judea, you find the response to Yeshua is division, not a united front against him. Um, and also, I think that there's also another element. Um, and when we get to Revelation, we're going to talk about um, Revelation 2 9 and 3 9, those who say they are Jews but are not. Um, this was intra Jewish polemic. You had Jewish groups calling other Jewish groups not really part of God's people. And, and um, I think the, the, the fourth gospel does it in a, in a somewhat different way as part of intra-Jewish polemic. Okay, you want the, the title, you know, you guys can have the title, but throughout the rest of, of the gospel, he undermines that uh, use of the title by when he speaks of his sheep, when he speaks of the vine and the branches in the vine, uh, in light of Psalm 80, in light of Isaiah 5, using imagery for God's people in the Tanakh for his own followers uh, to say, okay, if there's this division, we're not the ones who are being unfaithful to our heritage. You guys who are kicking us out, <laughs> I mean, we're following the promised Messiah, you know, so believe. John or not, whether you believe that Yeshua is the Messiah or not, at least you can see why John would say what he would say as a Jewish believer, uh, just like the prophet said, no, we are, uh, you know, there's a righteous remnant within Israel, but the rest of you guys are not, are not really following the Torah. Well, John says that over and over again in the gospel. Um, those who follow Yeshua, you know, in Moses' day, people couldn't just say, well, you know, we, we like what Abraham did, but we're not going to accept the, the Torah because, you know, Abraham didn't have the, the, the full Torah. When the Messiah comes, there's the expectation that you're going to follow the Messiah. Um, now, in terms of how Gentiles and Jews dialogue, um, we don't start with the rhetoric of John, and we don't start with the rhetoric of uh, ancient Jewish sources that were against thing, you know, that spoke of the minim as, as schismatics, and uh, at least some of the minim they were talking about were Jewish believers in Yeshua, and you know, some, some sources, I think one place in the Talmud talks about their foreskin being sewn back on so they can be, uh, uh, sorry, uh, so yeah, so that they can be considered pagans and thrown into Gehenna. I mean, you, you had some strong rhetoric on both sides. That's not the, the way we want to be dialoguing today. Um, but we also need to understand the context in which these things were, were said. 